Hello, and welcome to Wicked Wednesdays, your weekly podcast on sex and sexuality, the BDSM lifestyle, kink, and soon a series on poly relationships in general. The kink poly community is pretty, there's a lot of overlap there. I am your host, Wicked Fellow, and today I want to do a bit of a question and answer session, as well as a brief update on business, and an introduction to an exciting new series I think you will be interested in. So on the business front, um, last week our site was taken down. According to Pornhub, it was a mistake. It should not have been taken down. What I think happened based on the emails back and forth that I've gotten is they have a reporting system. Any general member of the public can report a video for whatever reason. And since we make rough videos, our videos get reported more frequently than I could like. People don't seem to understand that it is a scene. There's a reason we've been going above and beyond the call of duty to include content warnings and make it clear in the scene that it is a scene. But since what we also specialize is, but since what we also specialize in is giving you the realest, most genuine content we can, it looks real because it is real. However, it's consensually real. So, we get reported a lot, is the long and short of that. When they went to verify the model, which is what they're supposed to do, you know, if there's a report, they need to make sure that the model is a registered, verified model. They couldn't match the model with my models, which is, that's entirely on them. This happens more frequently than you might think. I've had to re-verify models several times, um, including Bunny, and Bunny's been in the studio since day one, At one point, there were a hundred bunny videos, so you would think that they had plenty of proof that she was a consenting member of my studio. However, just recently, they made me re-verify her, which means sending in her ID, sending in a picture of her holding her ID, and in this case, they wanted a signed model contract as well. So these are hoops we jump through. Anyway, um, since they couldn't verify that model, I assume what they meant to do was just take down that model's videos. However, what they did was take down all of our videos. And as you might imagine, that's rather disconcerting. If you are a semi-pro, you know, pornographer, and this is your primary means of income, having all of that taken away is never a good deal. Pornhub was surprisingly responsive, um, and I thank them for that. Often I don't hear back from their team for weeks when I have a question. So they got back to me within a few days. I think it was three days later, I got an email from them. And then a couple days later, they had our site back online. However, they decided that they had to re-verify every single one of our videos. And we've had videos sit in the review process for months. So I was pretty concerned that it was going to take a very long time to get our site back. What they ended up doing was they reposted almost all of our videos within the following week, except for the model in question. They had me re-verify that model, which I did. And I assume that her videos will be back online soon. Yeah, so that was a big hiccup. You know, it dropped our views to zero. It dropped our revenue to zero. It dropped our ranking in Pornhub to zero. I know that may seem like a, you know, kind of a silly internet points kind of thing. But it's not because the higher ranked a model you are on Pornhub matters very much on how they promote your videos, right? So if you have a very high ranking account and we were, you know, for a while we were in the top 100 and then when we got our videos pulled, we fell into the top 200. Still, there are 90,000 plus models on Pornhub. Those top you know, 100, 200, 300 accounts are pushed more than, say, account number 97,000, you know, 50. So when your ranking drops, they don't push your videos alongside other videos of the same genre, right? People looking for this kind of rough porn, click on a link, and then the videos displayed underneath that link are our videos and other videos like that. Well, if you have a zero model ranking, or I think we dropped down to like 70,000, um, you're not going to be the one. You know, I'm sure that their algorithm has occasionally puts one of those low ranking vids up, 
But from the research I've done, from going online and searching, you tend to see the same production studios getting pushed, and they are the top of the field, right? So it does actually matter what rank we are on Pornhub. You know, I know that my Pornhub ranking and $5 will get me just about nothing at Starbucks. So I don't take it too seriously as far as I'm the number 175th porn star. Uh, it is funny. When we were at the peak of our ratings, back when we had all of our videos, I was the number one bald male amateur over 40. So for a brief moment, I had my bald shining moment in the sun. Um, but yeah, there's been times where our channel among the amateur productions was in the top 10. Now, that just means, you know, over since I'm a male performer and the site is listed as a male performer, you can break Pornhub's rankings down by just about any criteria you want. You know, if you just want to say who was the top female bald tattooed model, you can find that out. Pornhub has, you know, filters to give you that result. Um, when you're going up against the pros, you know, you're going up against people like Alex Adams who have literally billions of views. And that's not us, right? So I don't really compare our studio to a professional studio. I compare our studio to the other amateur studios because that's what we are. You know, you can argue semantics on what is the difference between professional and amateur. I try to keep our videos as real and amateurish homemade as possible. You know, I certainly have the ability now to create very slick, well-lit, clean, very well edited videos, right? But I don't really want that aesthetic. I don't want to look like a pro studio. I don't want to have really good lighting and surgically enhanced models, etc. I want it to be real. I want it to reflect what we actually do in our real life. I want it to look good. You know, I want you to be able to see what's going on. And over the last four years, we've gone from filming every video on one iPhone to now we set up three cameras and we set up various ways of miking everything. And I've been working very hard on that because audio has been an issue in our videos. Um, hopefully you haven't noticed it as much because I spent a lot of time in editing and fixing the sound. But on my side, um, sometimes the audio in our videos is so bad, I almost abandon it and have abandoned videos because I just couldn't fix the sound. So I recently bought new microphones. I recently bought um, different ways of recording audio in scene, aside from the microphone that's on the camera, because that's never, you know, that's not really there to capture sound. From a, from a pro audio standpoint, the microphone on your camera is there so you can sync audio with the track. It's not there to be published. If you ever do any film work, you'll note that the cameras and sound are separate, completely separate. However, there is actually a microphone, even on these really big expensive cameras, and it's just picking up ambient audio, and it's enough to get the clack of the, the slate board, because that makes syncing up your audio very simple when you have that sharp, clear line. So the audio on, say, a GoPro, I mean, it's not horrible. It's fine if you're doing a mountain biking video but it's not very good for an indoor porn scene. It doesn't pick up very well. It's a condenser mic. It picks up all of the sound, much like your ears do, but unlike your ears, it doesn't have a brain in between the microphone and the listener to filter out all the sounds that you don't hear because they are part of your environment. So condenser mics are awesome. Um, they're very sensitive and they do hear the same way that people hear, as in if you put a condenser microphone in a room, you'll hear the room noise, you'll hear the AC vent, you'll hear the fan whirring, you might hear cars passing outside, you might hear crickets chirping and birds. And that's awesome. It gives you very natural, clear sound. However, when you're in your house, you hear that stuff, but your brain has lowered it down and, and removed it from your listening experience to a high degree. So when you're watching something and your brain saying, okay, focus on what you're seeing. Well, now you hear every creak and you hear the fan and you hear the AC duct and you hear the cars outside and you hear all the sounds that microphone is picking up. 
that's a negative thing when you're trying to make a porn video. You know, you don't notice the bed creaking when you're having sex, but you definitely notice the bed creaking when you're watching a porn video. It gets really annoying. And I've had to go back and literally manually duck every single squeak in a 30 minute video. And that takes a long time. That takes a very long time. I've learned some hard lessons about how to be a porn producer. You know, if you have a sound issue on set, fix it. Don't think, oh, I'll just fix that in post-production. That's a big mistake. So, um, a bit of a tangent there on microphones, but just saying that I have invested in improving our sound quality. I've invested in improving our video quality, but I don't want it to look like a pro video. You know, I don't want you ever to mistake one of our videos for a professional, you know, a professionally produced video on Pornhub, because that's not what I do. It's not what I'm interested in. And it's not the aesthetic that I like. So that said, our model ranking, we're being ranked against other amateurs and against Pornhub overall. So our 175th ranking currently is overall, which is not bad for an amateur studio. I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm proud of it. But more importantly, when we lost all of our videos, we lost that ranking as well. So, bit of a sidetrack, I understand. I appreciate you coming along for the ride with me. When you get in the car on these podcasts, you never know where we're going to end up. Because I don't script these. And that's a good segue into my next announcement, which is I have launched a Patreon. This is something I probably should have done a long time ago. But losing our Pornhub site and all the revenue with it made me rather desperate to scramble around and figure out, hey, I can't be reliant upon one website anymore. That's not a good idea. So I need to spread out my resources. I need to get on other sites and I need to find other ways of funding this endeavor that I'm doing. So the first thing I did is I set up an X hamster and an X video site. Currently, they are up and running, and you can search for them, Wicked Ways Studios or Wicked Fellow, it should come up. And there's only five videos on either of those links. It turns out that not all porn sites are created equal. And X Hamster and X Videos, while they are both very large sites, they just don't have the infrastructure that Pornhub does. And their interfaces, the way they upload videos, the way that they manage videos, it's all different. And I spent a week learning those two systems and the fact that one is called X videos and one is called X hamster has led me to unbelievable amounts of confusion because I'll get an email from X hamster that I need to respond to. And I'll accidentally respond to issues I'm having with my X videos, you know, first world porn producer problems. I understand, but we are uploaded. We are verified. Neither one of those is monetized yet. And that's fine. It takes a while to accumulate enough views and then be invited into their model program. They have a creator program, each of them. They also allow for premium video sales again. Now I need to investigate that more. I don't know if they are serviced by the credit card companies or if people have to use, you know, a cryptocurrency to buy videos. Um, I would very much like to be able to sell our full length premium videos again. At one point, that was a nice secondary rev revenue stream for us, which disappeared when Pornhub lost credit card support. So if one of those two companies offers a good premium package for selling porn videos, you will start to see our full length videos up there again, including, and this should be exciting for some of you, Ruby's vids. Ruby is fine with me selling them individually. She doesn't want her videos up on a free site because of the exposure level. You know, millions and millions of people see the free site. Very few people see the premium paid site. We might take some extra steps to disguise her identity a bit. But other than that, yes. Ruby's videos will be for sale as soon as I have a platform that I trust and that isn't a free site based platform. So anyway, I set up X videos. I set up X hamster and I also set up a Patreon. When I made the Patreon account, it's very much because of viewer demand. And I frequently am asked, do you have an OnlyFans? Do you have a Patreon that we can help support? Which is awesome. And prior to last week, I didn't want to go that route. I liked being essentially free for almost all of my viewers. Because Pornhub, the advertising on Pornhub, 
allowed us to put out free content that also earned us revenue. And I like that model. It's the internet age. It's very difficult to get people to pay for stuff when they can get it for free. I understand that. Um, but a lot of my fans wanted to support the channel and they wanted to support things like this podcast because this podcast does not make any money. It's something that I enjoy doing. I've enjoyed this outlet. It's also something that I feel a responsibility to do in that I try to make this an educational podcast in the kink and BDSM and poly world. And so since we make rough videos, since we make videos that the lay person, the vanilla person might mistake as abuse, I want to put this podcast out there to help people understand what kink is, what BDSM is, what these, you know, strange alternative sexual practices are. So they understand that what I'm putting out there is not abuse. You know, I'm not into that. I don't support that. I don't like seeing people abused. Abused, by definition, means that one of the parties doesn't want it to happen. Right? That's the key. So consensual rough sex, that's not abuse. Both parties are into it. And we're going to get into that in my upcoming lecture series on BDSM. So when I set up the Patreon, it's good to offer exclusive Patreon only content for your subscribers. And I'm fine doing that. My problem is I have no idea what to give you guys. And what I mean by that is I can't take a lot of time to create content specifically for Patreon that only Patreon viewers can see at this point. It's possible that somewhere down the line, if the Patreon ends up being a revenue source, I could do that. But at the moment, I need to continue to make free content because that's what makes us money right now. And in this transition period, I'm going to try to kind of work double tides and create content for Patreon and create content that's free for you all. This podcast will always be free. The Wicked Wednesdays podcast will be free forever. I may, at some point, create an additional podcast that is subscriber-based. I'm not sure what I'd talk about. Who knows? But this podcast will be remain free. I enjoy doing this, and I feel a responsibility to put this out there. And it gets a lot of listens. It gets a lot of views. If I had the same listenership on, say, Apple Podcast as I get views on Pornhub for this podcast, I'd be very successful. But it's a very different business model. So on Pornhub, we just clicked over 100,000 views on all of the podcasts, which is cool. You know, I'm, I'm impressed by that. I'm surprised that I think around podcast 11, we hit 100,000 total views of the podcast, you know, versus several thousand views on Buzzsprout, several thousand views on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. On those platforms... A podcast that gets 3,000 downloads doesn't exist. You know, it's nothing. However, if I had 100,000 views on iTunes, that would be a very different story. So because of the nature of the podcast, it's a not safe for work podcast. It is aimed at a very niche, you know, segment of the population. I don't expect it to ever get super popular on Apple Podcasts. So to help support this podcast, I created the Patreon. To help support the channel, I've created the Patreon. If you are one of my longtime viewers and you enjoy our content and you don't want to pay anything for it, I totally understand. I really do. I've never wanted it to be a pay-to-play service. If you are one of our listeners and you like our content and you like these podcasts and you want to help out, please do. Um, I will put the link to our Patreon it's, you know, Wicked Way Studios. If you search Patreon, you should be able to find it. I haven't actually done this yet, but I will check. I will put the link to our Patreon. And yeah, you know, think about subscribing for a few bucks a month. You know, two or three bucks is nothing for an individual. But if a hundred of you do that, all of a sudden this podcast turns into something that is a revenue generating stream. And that makes it easier to produce. Because right now I have to find time. I have to make time to do this podcast that costs me money instead of earning me money. But you guys are worth it, and I'm into it. 
I am going to launch a series of BDSM 101 level classes. And this is in response to a viewer listener who wrote in and said that she really enjoyed the podcast, but she often felt like she was, you know, a couple grades ahead of where she should be because I have been speaking to you, the listener, as if you're part of the scene, like you've been doing this for a few years and you understand basic terminology. And that's fine. You know, this podcast is aimed at kink and BDSM people. But for people who have no idea what I'm talking about, some of the words I'm using, some of the terms, some of the acronyms, you know, they don't understand what they are. And I totally get that. And it, the writer made a very good point in that I do need to have a basic intro to BDSM series. So starting next week on Wednesdays, every Wednesday, there will be a new podcast in the BDSM 101 series. And, you know, we're literally going to start with the basics. You know, what does the acronym BDSM stand for? For you more advanced kink people, for you more, for those of you that have been in this lifestyle for a while, you know, don't worry. It's not going to be something that will bore you because, yes, I will define these terms. I will say, you know, this is the nested acronym that is BDSM. But I'll also use it as a springboard to talk about more advanced level BDSM practices more in-depth relational practices, etc. So I'm planning on using it as a catalyst to help me make more podcasts to help people understand what BDSM is. I'm sure there are some good podcasts out there, but the beautiful thing about podcasting is when you listen to my podcast, you're hearing my point of view, my truth, my experience, which is completely different than anybody else in this community. And that doesn't make it any more or less valid than another podcast, but they can exist side by side. There doesn't have to be one BDSM podcast. I would hope that there are plenty. I would hope that there's one for each kind of listener out there. So yeah, I'm going to do what a lot of other podcasts I'm sure have done and just start at the basics. So look for that next week. Um, if you would like, you know, support us on Patreon. I appreciate that very much. You can also support us by liking our videos. You know, it's a, it seems like a very simple thing, but if you click that like button, you increase the like dislike ratio in our favor, which helps on our revenue and it helps on our viewership. You know, more people will see a video with 98% likes than 87% likes. So that's a very simple free way you can help the studio, you know, on Pornhub, Xvids, Xhamster, check out our videos, watch them. And if you genuinely like them, click like, you know, it would help us out tremendously to keep our ratings high on Pornhub, especially if you want to be a featured performer, if you want to be on the front page, it has to be 90% or above with a lot of views. You know, as soon as it drops below 90%, it's no longer in the algorithm to be featured. And that's kind of rough. But yeah, you guys can help us out a lot by simply liking our videos, sharing our content with people you know, if that's something that they would enjoy and find comfortable. You know, there's all kinds of things you can do. However, there is no obligation to do any of this stuff. If you just want to listen to the podcast, cool. If you want to watch our videos for free, watch everything we have out there. Um, I'm going to try to continue to provide the same level of video output, the same level of quality, Everything that you've come to expect from the studio, the Patreon and the exclusive content, that's going to be above and beyond what I'm currently doing for those subscribers. If you have an idea, dear listener, of things you would like to see on our Patreon, we've had people suggest that I do more photo shoots and only upload the photos to Patreon. I can do that. I've had, I actually have quite a large catalog of erotic photography that I've done in a shibari setting and other settings that's not really on the internet. Um, so I'm happy to put that on our Patreon. People have talked about doing, you know, kind of ASMR readings of erotic, you know, fiction and erotic literature. I'm happy to do that. I don't want to steal somebody else's content to do that, if that makes sense. Like, I don't want to read from a popular erotic book on my podcast for money. 
So I do have quite a bit of things that I have written. Um, I'm not a great, you know, eroticism writer. However, I have written quite a bit. I will be recording and uploading that to the Patreon. I'm happy to read, you know, user submissions. I'm happy to do, you know, individual ASMR type activities on that exclusive podcast. I do need ideas. So yeah, if you, if something you want to see, maybe you want to see a weekly journal, maybe you want to see a more behind the scenes look at Wicked Ways Studio. If you have ideas, leave them in the comments, write to me at hiswickedways at gmail.com. Contact us on Instagram or Twitter on Pornhub, Xvids, and Xhamster. It is very easy to get a hold of us. Um, and please do keep your fan mail coming, especially your fan mail that has questions for us. I would be happy to turn this into a more question and answer driven podcast. You know, I want to be the Dan Savage of the BDSM world, a little bit more BDSM because he frequently covers kink topics on his channel. You know, if you have a question about BDSM, write it to me. If you want it to be private, you know, you don't want me to mention your exact situation or your name or anything else, your username, of course, just say so. And I won't mention it. But if you're comfortable with me using that question on this podcast, you know, say, hey, you know, here's my question. I'd be happy to see it included in the podcast, etc. Um, I get a lot of mail and I enjoy it. I really do. It takes a lot of time. Um, I can wake up with 50 or 60 messages, depending on the day, especially when we get featured. I don't think a day has gone by in the last four years where someone hasn't reached out with a compliment or a question. And I got to tell you, it helps. It may not seem like it, even after all this time, you know, with all the stress that I went through last week with the studio to have people writing in and saying, Hey, you know, I really like your content. If there's anything I can do personally to help, let me know. And I'm appreciative of it. I'm touched by that. I really am. When I sit down in the studio and I'm talking to a camera, I am envisioning myself speaking to you guys, my listeners, based on all the responses I've gotten from you, based on all the feedback we've gotten as a studio. I've kind of made this amalgam of our viewers. So I do think about who I'm talking to when I make these podcasts and when I make these videos. So yeah, you know, write in with your questions, write in with stuff that you want to see on these podcasts, write in with suggestions for our new Patreon adventure. I'm going to answer a bunch of questions that I've gotten recently. Um, this will be a bit of a kind of about Wicked and about the studio themed Q&A. A listener asks, and I've been asked this about a thousand times, so how old are you? Okay, so I... If you look on Pornhub and my sites, my birthday is June 6th, 1966. Here's a behind the scenes. That's not my real birthday. Just like my real name is not Wicked Fellow. If you write out my birthday, you'll understand why I chose that. I chose that A, because it's kind of funny. And B, because I can remember it. And your porn birthday is important because it should be consistent across all of your platforms, etc. You don't want one thing to say you were born on December 1st and another thing to say you were born on January 8th. So, you know, when I first got into this and Pornhub asked me how old I was, that's what I put in. It's had an unintended side effect. And, and I don't know why more people don't do this because, as you know, if you're a porn viewer, models are routinely passed off as younger than they really are. You know, if you watch... A video entitled 19 year old gets in trouble at college it's very likely that models in her late 20s possibly even in her 30s and when you look at the video it's it's pretty obvious You're like yeah that person is not 19 years old so once you get to a certain age in porn my age and below my age even you know it's kind of more and more important to be younger than you really are well since I went the opposite direction and I put an age that's significantly older than I really am, I've actually seen comments like, you know, wow, he's in his 50s. He looks really good. And that's very amusing to me because for a person in their mid 40s, which is what I am, I don't look that great. But for a 56 year old, I look awesome. So, yeah, here's a tip to porn producers out there. List your age is significantly older than you are. 
and then you get kind of extra credit for looking normal for your age. There you go. So no, I'm not going to tell you my actual age. I'm in my mid forties. You know, this is the internet. This is 2021 and privacy is important. So even birth year is important. And I want to do everything I can to help make it more difficult to narrow that stuff down. So yeah, early forties is how old I am. And I will probably always be in my early forties until my actual age meets my legitimate porn age. And by then I hope to have retired and be living on a small Island where there are no phones. Someone asks, what are you drinking in your videos? I get that a lot, actually. Um, Sharp-eyed viewers will note that I almost always have a tumbler. And it is my habit to enjoy an old-fashioned when I make these. Believe it or not, it's fairly medicinal. The alcohol helps clear out any gunk and obstructions you have in your throat. It can be a little harsh, so you have to do it in moderation. Otherwise, you start to sound like Tom Waits. Nothing against that gentleman. He's a favorite of mine. But yeah, an alcoholic drink can help clear your throat. And singers know this. Talk show hosts know this. Sometimes they'll use like a vinegar solution or a solution that has a high citric acid content. That can also do the exact same thing. But I promise you that a bottle full of lemon juice is not as pleasurable as my old fashioned that I have. So yeah, I do enjoy an old fashioned. And I, I raise a glass and cheers to all my, my listeners. You should enjoy an old fashioned while you listen to our podcast. This episode brought to you by Enjoy an Old Fashioned and make it yourself because I think you know that when you order a mixed drink at a bar, most of the time you're pretty disappointed, right? You get this little plastic cup that has some mix in it and a little bit of alcohol and you think, I just paid $11 for this. So yeah, I, I tend to not order drinks when I go out. If I'm at a, a really good restaurant, sometimes I'll experiment and occasionally I'm surprised. Occasionally someone will make me a decent old fashioned and it's not a hard drink. You know, it's a very simple, basic cocktail. It's kind of one of the first cocktails, hence the name. I've gone to very, very good bars. You know, there's a place in DC called Jack Rose Whiskey Saloon. At least it used to be. I don't know if it's still there. That place was like heaven for me because they had some of the best you know, mixologists, cocktail, you know, bartenders I've ever seen. And the old fashions that I had there influenced how I make them myself and also made me understand that there's more than one kind of whiskey. Um, having grown up in the Midwest, uh, whiskey came in a bottle with a black label on it, right? And that was whiskey. I had no idea that whiskey could have so many different flavors and varieties until I started, you know, going to much more high end places. Um, and it made me quite the connoisseur at the same time. It also kind of ruined me because really good whiskey is also really expensive whiskey and bourbon, et cetera. This is made with four roses, uh, not a sponsor of the podcast, but if they would like to be, here's to you. Okay. Off of that tangent and on to another Q and a, are you in relationships with your models or are they just paid? Yes and no. And let me try to explain this. I don't tend to work with professional models. You know, at this point in my career, none of my models have been someone that I didn't know and I simply paid to come perform with me. I'm not opposed to that. It just hasn't been what I've done. Partially, the reason I don't do that is in order to achieve the dynamic that we have on screen, there has to be a legitimate relationship between the two people, I think. Um, so every model you've seen so far, Bunny, Sadie, Ruby, Katja, and Lavender, I have real life relationships with them to some extent or another. Now, you know, with Bunny, at one point we were partners and lived together and shared a life. So obviously that's a very close relationship. My relationship with Ruby was very different in that she reached out through the channel and said, Hey, I love your videos and I want to be in them. We developed a relationship of friendship based out of that interaction before we ever filmed together. And that relationship continues now that she stopped filming. You know, I like to have a much closer working friendship, sometimes partnership with my models. 
So the answer is yes and no. Sometimes I'm no longer in a relationship. Like Bunny and I haven't been in a relationship for years now. Uh, she's doing fine. She's doing her own cam girl thing. But we're not in a current relationship. Versus, say, Concha and I are in a current relationship and we still film together. Lavender and I have a good close friend relationship, but she's not one of my partners. So she lives in another state and she has her own partner. And we became friends long, long before we filmed together. Um, I think she reached out to the channel in the first year we made it. And she was one of those people that, you know, reached out to my inbox. And then that became a, you know, messenger conversation that eventually became, hey, why don't you come for a visit? I, I know all of my models personally. I don't pay any of them just to come make porn. I do share profits with all of them based on the performance of their videos. When I, I have two modeling contracts that I offer to potential models. One is paid per scene. You know, we're going to do this scene and you're going to get paid this much for it. The other one is we're going to shoot a scene. You're not going to receive any money for it. I'm going to put it online. And for the space of one year afterwards, you get paid a percentage of the revenue generated by that video. That is safer for me. And it tends to be better for the model because you never know when you make these videos what's going to sell and what's not. Therefore, I can't afford to pay a lot up front for a scene. And in that situation, you know, they're much better off taking the one year of revenue generating payments because that can be very high. You know, based on how popular a video becomes, that can be a lot of money every month based on their percentage in their contract. So, so far, all of my models have opted for the, you know, continuing over a year payment schedule. So yeah, nobody gets anything up front so far. And that's something I'm happy to do if that would be what the model wanted. If the model was like, no, I don't really want residuals. I just want to be paid up front. And that is something that I'm open to. It's just hasn't happened yet. Okay, this one isn't a question, but it's a comment. Um, I do want to start getting back to the comment of the week. One problem is, is that when your videos are all taken down, they the comments go with them and I don't save every string we have. This is a comment. Um, it made me chuckle. I've been called a lot of things. I've been called a, you know, I've been called some names. When, when you make an online porn presence, you need to have a thick skin because people will be viciously cruel to you and you have to be able to shrug it off and move forward. And I've had people threaten me. I've had people say the worst things about me and my lineage dating back to the time of Adam. And I just shrug and let it go because in this particular situation, I'm the one making the porn and they're the guy at home watching it. So it's pretty easy to be like, yeah, okay, you know, that's your opinion, man. But I've got 137,000 subscribers that like what I do. So, you know, anyway, this guy, this guy is a connoisseur and he calls me something I've never been called before in a porn video. Okay, so here's the comment. The Coxman's one leg support, pillow raise, doggy position, will surely be copied for its deep entry, cervix pounding ability. I've never been called a Coxman before. I kind of like it. I might put it on my business cards. Wicked fellow, porn producer, filmmaker, Coxman. It's not as self aggrandizing as, say, Cockmaster. But Coxman, you know, it implies a journeyman level of skill, someone that knows what they're doing and practices at a professional level. So I appreciate that. I don't think that um, it's going to catch on, but being called a Coxman kind of made my week last week. So I appreciate it. And yeah, um, I didn't think of myself as a trendsetter. If I do a position um, in porn, porn sex and real sex, are not the same thing. What feels good in real sex doesn't look good in porn. That's the biggest problem. You know, when I'm having real sex with my partners, it doesn't tend to look like what we do on film. You know, for one, when you're having real sex, you're not worried about if the camera can see you properly and if the camera can see the action and if you look good at the moment. 
right? And you're welcome to try this out at home. You know, when you're having sex next time, think about if there was a camera there, what you would look like and how you would make the camera see what you wanted it to see. And oh, by the way, don't get in your head and forget about what you're doing. I think the position he's talking about, for me, um, it's a combination of things. One, he says the, uh, the one leg support. So yeah, I do tend to have sex like that on camera because it clears the way for the camera right? If I have both legs down on the bed, and this is a prone bone position, by having one leg up or one leg back, it allows the camera to see what I want the camera to see. It also has the advantage of helping me support my back because I don't have a great back. I've had seven back surgeries. And so sometimes what we do and the positioning of what we do can be very painful for me. So yeah, what you're seeing is a combination of camera experience, you know, understanding when I'm blocking the camera with my body and a fair amount of disability in that there's some positions I can't do because I can't support myself properly because of my back. And that's just how it goes. Fortunately for me, um, most of the positions that look good in porn are pretty easy for me with, you know, the limited mobility that I have. Unfortunately for me, sometimes I end up after a, a session, you know, if I do a long couple hour session, I can be laid up for a while. I can be in a lot of pain, but yeah, there are, there are worst ways in the world to make a living. So I'm not complaining. Be picking up rocks in the rain. And finally, I'm going to end this particular question and answer session with a humorous anecdote that happened this week. As anybody that follows my Instagram will know, I'm a big motorcycle enthusiast. There are a few things I like more than being on my bike. Um, and I ride kind of, it's not a super rare bike, but it's a rare enough bike that there are groups on Facebook associated with it. I'm pretty sure that almost every bike has a following, but anyway, mine is particularly cult-like. And I was reading through the comments on one of my groups, and the thread was about different times people have seen this motorcycle in movies, for example, kind of train spotting for Yamaha VMAX. And someone wrote... Hey, no kidding. Some dude on Pornhub made a porn video and he's banging his girl on the back of a Gen 1 VMAX. I was pretty sure I knew he was talking about. He was kind enough to provide video of the video, which Facebook took down immediately. Um, however, I was able to see it and it was one of our videos. I can't tell you the temptation I had to not respond with the Obi-Wan of course I know him. He's me. Um, but I do try to keep my personal and professional life separate. However, that was a, a funny little outside of the porn world recognition, though it wasn't me that was recognized. It was my motorcycle. So props to that. that was, it was pretty funny. All of, all of the models enjoyed that, especially Lavender, who was the babe in question. So yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. All right. So next week, you'll see the beginning of the BDSM 101 podcast. It will be very similar to these. You'll still have an update on the studio. I'll still do some Q&A stuff, but it'll have a theme. This is the first time I've tried a theme in this podcast, so I hope you like it. If there are things you want me to talk about, write to me. You know, hiswickedways at gmail.com. You can write to me on Pornhub, Twitter, Instagram. It's not hard to get a hold of me, so reach out. If you have suggestions for things I can put on my Patreon that you would actually pay money for and be a subscriber, send that to me. I appreciate your support. Please give us a review if you listen on iTunes or Spotify. If you watch this on YouTube, you know, give it a thumbs up. I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed making these for you guys. And I'm going to continue to try to make this a more professionally produced podcast. This should sound different than our previous podcasts. I've upgraded the mics. And for those of you watching the video cast, you can see that I've changed the studio a bit. I've changed cameras and I have, you know, actually done lighting, which I normally don't do. I normally just, you know, press record on my camcorder and talk to it for an hour. I figure if I'm going to ask people to help support this podcast, I should give them a more professionally produced product. So. If you like the new look, if you like the new sound, let us know. 
give us a comment, give us a like, give us a dislike if we deserve it. As for that, this is all for this episode of Wicked Wednesdays. Thank you for joining us. Push that envelope, but don't break it, and stay safe out there.